have it interview, so I hope I'm not too, um, what shall I say, uh, stale. But uh, very nice to welcome um, to uh, this channel, um, Matt Chandler. So Matt, um, thank you for joining us. Oh, listen, it's good to be back. It's been a long time since we've gotten to catch up, really, so. Yeah, that's right. Um, so today we're going to talk about some pretty serious stuff. We're going to talk about suffering, and I'm not talking about the sort of thing where, I don't know, you're going shopping and you can't get that parking space you're praying for. Um, and Matt, I realized when I was preparing for this that it's almost exactly 10 years ago now since um, one Thanksgiving day, you, you obviously had your collapse um, and uh, you know, were diagnosed with brain cancer. And I remember well um, both watching the vlogs at that time um, and being quite impacted by that. And you know, thank you for sharing such personal material with us all those years ago. And then coming to Jubilee and having the privilege of interviewing you and also hearing you in the congregation. There I was 10 years ago. I'll never forget you looking out and saying, look, you know, um, you, 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 I think you described it as having like an ax hanging over you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you said, um, but the only difference between me and you is that I know it. And I remember thinking there, oh yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, but obviously for myself, uh, two and a half years ago now, I, I really did start to get it with my own sort of cancer experience. So I really thought it'd be great to have a chat with you um, today about some of that and, and about uh, your new book, which I must show now just while I remember. And I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but I do like this one. Uh, uh, sort of yeah. The darkness of, the, of suffering with the sort of glimmer of joy, the grim, glimmer of light coming in there. And I'm not very uh, good at holding this up, but I think that's the idea. So Matt Chandler and friends um, yep. and the joy of, of sorrow. So before we get into that though, Matt, may I just ask you, you know, how are you now 10 years on and, and where are you at both sort of in terms of physically and also how you yeah. look back on it now 10 years ago? Yeah, well, those are, I mean, I guess those are both pretty big questions. Uh, I, I physically um, feel amazing. Um, I mean, as amazing as a 45 year old with uh, three children still at home and uh, a large <laughs> network, you know, and uh, so, so physically uh, feel uh, great. Um, l looking back on it, um, I, I think there are, yeah, I, I think it can come in waves in, in different ways. One, immense gratitude um, for that season an earnest desire to not do it again, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to yeah. learn new lessons in a new way. Uh, so, so that's interesting, because I, I, I wanted to pick you up on that, actually, because one thing that you uh, you do catch some some sort of tracks from the reform, I think one of the interesting things for both you and I is we come from both the reform background and the charismatic background and sort of blend the both. And so perhaps we're exposed to the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. Uh, and certainly on the reform side, some people almost like welcome suffering. That's quite interesting to me to hear that you don't sort of say, you know, give me more, Lord, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciated very much my season in the valley of the shadow of death. And if if he would be so kind as to not, is to teach me another way in the future, I would I would love that. So, yeah. um, so no, I'm not, I'm not looking for it, but uh, I can now probably say I'm not afraid of it. Uh, and I don't know that I was afraid of it back then. I was more just naive. Uh, like like you you were explaining even your own experience with what I said a decade ago. I mean, that's probably where I was here. I was trying to teach a congregation how to suffer well. And for whatever reason, I wasn't thinking in any of that, that that had anything to do with me. I was just a vessel being used by the Lord to teach and prepare people. But in God's kindness, he was preparing me, right? Um, mm. so I couldn't see it that way until it was my turn. Um, so, yeah, that... Yeah, I, I certainly can look back with a great deal of gratitude looking at, um, uh, I think, a kind of resilience he built in me in that season. Like if you if you survived brain cancer, a lot of the stuff that's overwhelming to people in this day and age, they, they, don't, they don't affect me as much as I thought they would. So like if a Twitter mob goes after me, I just, I'm, I'm, I just tend to think I'm going to be all right. Um, because once you've, once you've been in that space where you think you've got two years to live, and you know that your kids are going to grow up without you and that your wife's going to probably wear another marry another man and that you're going to stand in front of you know god almighty and that like once you once you've walked through that valley it puts some things in perspective that that everybody knows but but doesn't really know and i think you can appreciate that now in a unique way that, that you know it i mean theologically you know it you know the text that teach you can even in some way um maybe maybe get get some of it into your guts but but man until you're on the precipice you know until you're mm. the one leaning over that chasm and and saying by by faith 
that man, it had better be about grace alone or I'm in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. I don't know that you can, you, you can be as transformed by it um, as, as maybe the Lord intends. Yes. I mean, it's almost like um, there's a sort of, I was joking about it the other day with somebody. It's almost like the um, Illuminati, you know, the, 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 the enlightened ones, you know, yeah. that, that, that actually majority of people um, in, in certainly in Western society now, and it's, it's historically and geographic, geographically unusual, of course, because this wouldn't be true if you were living in many parts of the world where, you know, childhood mortality was high and, you, yeah. know, and your, you know, women could die in childbirth and, and, and men like you and I would be old, you know, we'd yeah. be considered old <laughs> um, in many parts of the world. And obviously historically, I mean, you know, before vaccines and things like that, you know, one in four children would have died in childhood. So people, I guess, were more aware of their own mortality yeah. um, than, than most people today. And so, I don't know, it's almost like, um, you know, the veil has been lifted a little bit when you've, yeah. you've stared into that for yourself. Um, oh, and it, yeah, it also, it works in all sorts of ways too. Like you, you can know all the passages you want about marriage, but it's not until you're married that, they, that you start to feel the weight of them or understand them more fully, right? Like you can, mm. you can give me a beautiful exposition of love your wife like Christ loved the church, right? And, and that he gave himself up for her. Right? You, you can give me a beautiful exposition of that and not have experienced the weight of what it means to actually live that out within a covenant bond with a woman. And, and so my experience with suffering was that I knew the passages, I knew the doctrine. I, I think I could do great exposition uh, on what God's intent in it is at times and, and how he leverages and uses it for our good. Um, but man, it's a different thing, man, when you're on your bathroom floor trying to muster up enough strength to vomit again. I mean, that's just a yeah. different place that you, you're in the fire. Um, mm. The scriptures are coming alive to you and, and to great comfort, you know, uh, coming mm. alive to bring great comfort. So, yeah, I, I guess one of the things I sort of sometimes wonder about this, I mean, I used to know a, a pastor who was in a wheelchair and sort of in agony from um, ankylosing spondylitis. And I mean, he described that for him, you know, he didn't used to, bother to have his his um, uh, mouth numbed if he was going to have dental treatment because he said the pain of that was nothing compared to the pain of you know getting dressed every day when his wife had to dress him but he served as a joy-filled pastor I remember him well uh, in in the family of churches I'm part of in, in the early days and he would preach uh, and he would teach and he would pastor and he would counsel and I often wondered about what it must feel like for someone going in to see him you know, I don't know, with some sort of problem. I, I don't know, I'm having a difficulty time at work, you know, with my boss or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and just looking at this guy and thinking, yeah, maybe my problem's not quite so big. But the flip side of that, I was wondering, is as a pastor, you know, you obviously have to counsel people who have big problems and small. So how do you yeah. make sure that you don't just kind of almost well, demean I, those problems? Yeah, well, I, I think pain in a real way is relative based on uh, an individual's experiences and... Um, uh, how they're wired and how they're so I but for me it's not because people would would and still always couch in those kind of meetings like this is nothing like what you went through but and I'm like okay but you're still in a very real way suffering yeah so let's not I don't know that suffering's a game where like if you score yeah. it in you're like really suffering but if you're in an eight point, yeah. that's you know just get over it right um and so I don't know that I've ever I don't know that I've ever had to kind of wrestle through that it, it just feels like uh, suffering, suffering. And, and man, I wouldn't have known anything greater uh, mm. than, than what, 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 what I would probably consider now in my life to be small little pain points uh, until, mm. um, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and so someone's on, if, you, if you're kind of trying to scale it, uh, like if you're 32 and nothing bad has ever happened to you and everything you've touched turns to gold and all your relationships are beautiful and you write, um, and then all of a sudden you, you, you come down with asthma and you're not able to work out like you used to be able to work out and you're not able to play with your kids. Like you want to now all of a sudden like that is like life altering for you and, and can create a ton of suffering, but, but you wouldn't necessarily go, Hey, but this guy in the church, you know, he's got that late stage Parkinson's as a 40 year old and he's got it so much worse than you. So, so really it's a, I, I want to try to pastor the individual um mm. that that can feel overwhelmed because it up until that point in their life this is the most immense 
um, season of suffering uh, that they've endured. Uh, and so that's how I've always tried to learn to see it and, and try to navigate it um, so that I don't um, just be like, oh, come on, man, get over it. Um, mm-hmm. This is so small in comparison to the way other people suffer. Um, because in that case, I mean, you could even take my brain cancer and go, oh, give me a break, bro. What, you know, 18 months of high dose chemo. I mean, there are people that live their whole lives and right there, if you try to create yeah. a scale of, you know, like varsity level suffering and, and minor league suffering, yeah. varsity suffering, then, then really you're unable to shepherd and pastor people where they are. So. Yeah, for some reason that makes me think of Star Wars, that line in Star Wars, where it says, there's always a bigger fish. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, isn't it? Because you sort of feel uh, like, oh, you know, you've got to this kind of level. And, and of course, the other thing is, sometimes it's the small things that undo you and the big things don't yeah. undo you. And, or, or there can be a sort of moment. I mean, you might be sailing along fine and then suddenly, uh, I mean, one thing I know for me personally, probably the hardest point for me was when I got to the end of my chemo. Um, and they were saying, hey, you know, it's looking great in terms of the cells, you know, the, the cells that seem to have been, you know, largely controlled, it probably will come back at some point, blah, blah, blah. But it's at this point in remission, but I didn't feel better. You yeah. Know? And, and so that was a bit difficult for me. And I guess that's still where I'm living a bit. But I mean, that, that really hit me hard in some ways, yeah. harder than some of the other points. And so I suppose everyone does respond differently to the different things they face, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so I, I think to, to approach the person and not the pain itself is probably the, the, the most pastoral shepherding approach uh, is, okay, you, you certainly are suffering. I don't want to kind of scale that. I do want to kind of meet you where you are in this pain. And, and what are you wrestling with in light? And, and honestly, the majority of the time, I'm just trying to be present, not trying to fix. Uh, there's a kind of pain that you can't fix. Um, and that... Uh, a lot of your kind of, um, a lot of the ways you might try to fix would do more damage than good. Could you elaborate on that for a minute? Because I do think that there's a lot of Christian sort of thoughts and action and, and sort of perhaps overly simplistic counseling or pastoral teaching that, that does do that. What, what's the most harmful thing people can say at those times? Well, I, I think that um, depending on, you know, whether they were some of my reformed brothers or some of my charismatic brothers, those errors. Let's talk about both. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. They could, it could be, <laughs> it they're, comes both ways, they're you know? different. They're, they're different in the way they approach. So I, I think that um, so some that would be on the more charismatic non-reform side would, would like put it on me to just believe hard enough, um, which I thought was just like a horrible thing. Uh, to try to do, to put it on me, to believe hard enough as though that's how faith works. Um, and then uh, I, I found my more reformed brothers like didn't know how to pray with any expectancy or without kind of creating these caveats to give God a way out if he decided in his will not to heal me. So it's like they were trying to protect God. So there's very little boldness and expectancy in their prayers. Uh, and a lot of kind of uh, what felt to me at the time, trite one-liners, um, or Spurgeon quotes, or, you know, I've learned to kiss the rock that throws me on the, or I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me on the uh, rock, you know, yeah, praise God. Yeah. But I'm, that, that's not, can you just be here with me right now? Cause this really, really sucks. Um, okay. um, so I think those were some of the errors and, and I think just, it was an unfixable situation, right? I mean, I had primary brain cancer. It is incurable it two to three years. Um, I've got a, my oldest was a six year old at the time. Uh, I had a six month old. Um, and man, all of that stuff just felt trite. Even the things that were true felt trite. Uh, mm-hmm. and so I didn't in that moment need to be lectured. Um, what, what I needed is just presence. Um, and so that's, that, that's what I try to do now more than anything is just be there. Uh, and so sometimes that's just playing cards. Uh, other times that's just hanging around for a while and, you know, spending an hour or two in the room and just being there. Um, so that, that, that's some of the ways that I thought were really in, on both sides, really unfair and, mm. and well-meaning. I think both very well-meaning. No, no one was trying to be malicious. Nobody tries to be malicious to people who are suffering. I mean, I guess I'm sure there's cases where they, they are, but no one tried to be malicious to me. Um, and and part of it was my own journey in my own space and where I was at the time. And so, uh, I think people get weirded out 
by suffering and sorrow. They don't really know what to do with it. We live in such a kind of happy, clappy, don't post that on Instagram if it's not perfect culture that when there's real struggle and real suffering, people don't know how to enter into it. Uh, and so they fill the space with noise or things that they think they should say. Or, uh, and so part of it's a discipleship issue where we haven't really discipled people well uh, how to love others well in suffering. So. Mm. so on the positive side then, I mean, you've sort of said it a little bit. I guess you're saying a little bit like Job's friends, really, you know, that they, they, they were there. It was only when they opened their mouth after a few days yeah, that, think, that I mean, the problem I think started. That's a fair assessment. I think they were doing really, really well until they spoke. Yeah. That's a really interesting thing, isn't it? Because I do think some people struggle to spend time with someone who's in hospital or suffering or whatever, precisely because they don't know what to say. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe actually they don't need to say anything. They just need to yeah. be a friend. Yeah. I'd, like I had two friends uh, that flew in, um, one from St. Louis, one up from Austin. Uh, and then they just came to my house and sat with me one evening and, and had dinner. And this was in one of the darker seasons of it where I was still trying, I was still super discombobulated, uh, by the prognosis and, uh, the treatment plan that was in front of us. We hadn't really started it yet. And man, those brothers just came up and just sat in my living room with me. And I couldn't tell you one thing that we talked about other than just kind of how life was for them and what was going on for their kids and, how their things were going in their churches and where their own souls were. And then we, we had a meal together and they prayed over me and then they left. And for whatever reason, for everything that happened in that season, that stands out as a night where, um, man, the Lord really comforted me and kind of gave mm. me the sense that things were going to be okay, regardless of how they played out. That's, that's quite encouraging. Do you feel then that people who've experienced suffering um, can often find it easier to comfort others? Well, I think there's no question that, that that's true. I, I think you, you'll have a natural empathy uh, as you remember what it's like to feel alone, even though you're not alone, uh, and, and to, in, in the deeper parts, wrestle with anxiety as much as you wrestle with anxiety. You, or you, you, know, you finally learn, hey, this isn't, a, this isn't a war I get to win. It's just a battle I get to fight on anxiety. Um, and so you can feel like I, man, I've got members of our church, like I, I know one this week, um, later this afternoon, that's going in for a scan. And so I'm going to send him a text here in a little bit. Cause I just know what scan day is like. Uh, yeah. and, and so, so I think people who have endured suffering, um, will have a really compassionate heart for others that do, uh, especially those who have endured it for an extended season. Uh, because they've ridden the waves of it's going to be all right. And then, oh my gosh, is this the rest of my life? Um, and so those are, those are waves that anybody who suffers for a long period of time experiences. They'll, they'll have a day or a week or even a month where they're like, it's going to be all right. The Lord has me. I'm safe in his hands. And, and then like David in the Psalms, you turn the page and it's like, how long, oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Is this really going to be the rest of my life? You know, will I ever feel strong again? Will I ever feel? And, and so you, it, when you ride those waves concurrent, like you, you ride one, then you ride the other and you do it again and then you do it again and then you do it again. Um, you, you, you develop some sort of muscle in regards to empathy that, that really helps you love other people who are in similar situations. Cause you know, like, you know, when they're despairing that you don't need to quote Romans eight twenty eight to them, that you know where they are, they're on this way. So you're just present and you can just empathize. I remember, I hate this for you. I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do? Um, and, and then when they're, when, when they're on the wave of God's got me, guys, you can just praise God with them. So there, there's that you can rejoice with those who are rejoicing. You can mourn with those who mourn, right? Mm -hmm. uh, without not, you don't need to correct either one of those waves, right? You just get to be present in them. But you don't, I don't think you really know that if you haven't endured it. You certainly don't know it at a um, kind of a gut level. I, I can feel the feeling right now. And, and I don't know that everybody needs to be able to feel at a gut level. I can feel what you're feeling now to be a good friend, to be present in suffering, to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. But I do think that if you have endured, you're more apt to be able to do that. 
Yeah, I, I mean, one of the verses that springs to mind is in Corinthians, isn't it? And I'm going to quote this all wrong, I'm sure. Perhaps you can correct me uh, if your no. Bible knowledge is better than mine. But, you know, where it talks about the God, God being the God of all comfort, yeah. uh, who comforts us uh, in our troubles so that we can comfort others. And one of the things that's interesting about that verse is it doesn't say in the same troubles that, that we've had. So, I mean, obviously, you know, your situation is different to mine. Uh, but also actually other things, you know, like, I don't know, divorce or yeah. you know, other problems at work, all these kinds of things. I've certainly found uh, that it's people who've really suffered in one way or another who've been able to empathize more. And I felt, you know, they've, they've sort of been able to get it, really, and share comfort for me. Would, would you see that as well? Yeah, I, I, I see it uh, really in the life of our church with, with those who um, have endured um, this kind of loss or this kind of loss, um, this kind of suffering or this kind of suffering, they, they honestly make um, the, the best kind of aftercare shepherds um, for the life of the church, that, that there, is something, there, there is something, I think, unique given to them as they have found that comfort uh, in the dark. Yeah. Um, they see other people in the dark, they're able to come alongside and go, I, I know it's dark in here, but it, it gets light again. Because I think I think it was Rick Warren who said he doesn't like hiring people for his church unless yeah, they experience I, some yeah. sort of suffering. That's quite yeah, I interesting. Heard him, I heard him say that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you it would be an interesting <laughs> interview. Yes, it would. Yeah. Okay, tell me about the darkest season of your life before we hire you. So, and maybe yeah. maybe that's a great question. Yeah, because I mean, what the flip side of his tweet that he mentioned about it that I saw a few years ago was that he said that those who haven't significantly suffered tend to be a bit sort of twee. Uh, and a bit kind of dis, uh, dismissive of other people's sufferings was the kind of idea that he was saying. A bit like what we're saying, because, you know, like, I don't know, for example, on the anxiety thing, you know, the reverse is aren't there that says, cast your anxiety on him for he cares for you. And that, to me, that's a process. Yeah, you were describing that. It takes maybe a year, maybe a decade, you know, yeah. maybe your whole life. Um, whereas I think a lot of people read that verse today and that sort of, you know, instant coffee where, you know, we get annoyed if there's more than one person ahead of us in the queue at Starbucks or whatever. Yeah. And, and we sort of think, well, come on, you, you know, chop, chop. You know, this is what we're supposed to do instantly. And you shouldn't be anxious. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be depressed. You shouldn't be mourning even. Yeah, I don't, other than justification, I'm not sure of anything that happens spiritually in an instant. Uh, mm -hmm. I think all of it's, I mean, almost all of it's process, um, which is why the Lord asks us to be so gracious to one another. Um, mm. is very few things like, and, and one of the, you know, my, my charismatic side loves breakthrough. Um, and, and that moment where the spirit of God just kind of kingdom, like is just visible manifests in profound mm. powerful ways. But I, I'll teach most consistently that the biggest things that the Lord's going to accomplish in your life are going to take place over a long period of time without you much knowing that he's doing it. So that 10 years from now, you'll look back on where you are now and where you are then, and you'll be stunned at how much God has grown you uh, and how much more you love him and how much more you love his word and how much uh, freedom you're walking in. Um, and, and so that, that's the normative way that, that the Lord sanctifies his people. That's what we see in the New Testament. That's what we see really throughout the whole of scriptures. Now, and mm. then there are these moments of massive breakthrough that I want us to pray for and fast for and ask God for. Um, but, but God works over time and, and the cast your anxieties on him. He cares for you. Isn't like you did that. Great. Okay. Now let's move on. It, it's, yeah. I mean, it's that, that's something you, you cast your anxieties. And then two hours from now, you probably need to cast your anxiety again. And then the next day, let, let's do it again. And then four hours later, let's do it again. It, it's not like this kind of one time and then it, it's done. Uh, idea. And again, that, that goes a lot back to like, we don't like to talk about suffering and sorrow. We don't like to talk about death. They're like really taboo subjects in, in a day and age of where there, there's so much media and there's so many ways to brand ourselves. And um, we don't want mm -hmm. anybody to know that we struggle emotionally or that we are racked with anxiety or unless, and, and this is the, the flip side of that coin, unless that's kind of become our identity uh, and the way that that we want to be known and seen. Um, mm. but, but, but ultimately, yeah, I, I think process is, is how the Lord shapes his people. Mm. So, I mean, I don't know about yourself, um, in terms of materials, there hasn't been that many really sort of solid good books out there. I mean, the one I've, I've recently read was, um, Tim Keller's book. It took me months to read that. And yeah. it, it spoke about that idea of the journey and it's, yeah. it's an ongoing process. So there are times, 
for many people when and perhaps spiritually they, they almost feel that they've taken a step back and you sort of think hang on I'm supposed to be growing spiritually but this thing has actually called into question my whole faith you're sort of looking at yeah. well, do I really believe this you know um, all of that kind of stuff that goes on and I think sometimes people can well they can actually lose their faith at that moment can't they and, and walk away yeah, I, I certainly think that there's a refining element to suffering that, that really, uh, especially if the, you know, the, the um, infirmity is, um, if, it, if it's going to be um, mortal. So if you're told you're going to die and you've got a disease that, that ends in death, I mean, the kind of, I think, soul searching you do um, in a moment like that is, is really significant. I, I think where I've seen more people um, lose heart and, and maybe drop out of the faith, I want to give them a little bit more time, is that kind of long-term um, man. They've been prayed for a thousand times. They've been to every doctor on earth. They've been to, and still the pain persists. And, and they eventually just, you know, God doesn't hear. He doesn't love. If there is one, he certainly doesn't care for me kind of crisis um, that over a long period of time, I'm in the one I'm thinking of over two decades, um, which is even as I think about her, like to try to get my mind around two decades of debilitating pain every day. Um, and, and, you know, some of the most gifted men and women on earth praying for um, and, and just seeing nothing get better. Um, that, that, that creates a bit of a crisis and, and how you minister in that spot of, you know, there's not a verse she doesn't know or, you know, a quote she hasn't heard or, um, but man, it, it, it makes my heart heavy for people that, that have to endure that season. Um, and, and it is one thing to get our eyes up and look to glory. Um, but we're getting our eyes up from where we are. And when you're young and youngish, and that's been the last 20 years and we may have 20 more years of it. Um, that, that's a hard, that's a hard go. Mm. I think also the change and the shock, isn't it? Cause I mean, for many of us, uh, we get so much of our identity out of, you know, what we do. Uh, yeah. and I'm sure that must've been a thing for you, you know, like you're, you're, there you are. I remember thinking myself when I heard about it, like this, this guy, he's leading this great church. You know, if anyone quote, quote deserves to be, sure. um, to be free of this suffering, it's him because look, he's giving his life all these people are getting saved and the church is growing and then, wow, you, and it, it can be such a shock. You sort of think, why has God allowed this to happen? It's almost like we think we've got to deal with God somehow. That yeah. He won't let that sort of thing happen to us. Yeah. I, in fact, I remember when the, so my tumor was in the right frontal lobe. And I remember when Dr. Barnett, who's ended up being my surgeon uh, that, that took it out was explaining to me the functions of the right frontal lobe. And he was saying, well, it's, if you're going to have a brain tumor, this is where you want it. And I was like, well, oh, thank you. I, I, well, I'm glad that's where it is. And then he began to describe that the right frontal lobe does a lot of spatial reasoning, which is where you kind of look at an idea and then you file it away. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, that's all I do. That's the only, that's like the only gift I have is to be able to see information and file it and, and order it and communicate it in a specific way. So man, it'd be better if it was in a different location and not that location. And then, um, so, so I remember there being some pretty, um, yeah, I was, I was pretty shook at, at what might be happening simply because of the fact that, am I ever going to be strong again? Am I ever going to have the energy levels that I've had? Am I, am I going to be able to think the way I've been able to think? Am I going to be able to do some of the things I love, such as reading and kind of like a detective digging around to get to the bottom of this question that I have concerning the Lord, concerning, you know, this doctrine concerning how do I... Um, communicate this clearly and simply to people so that they can own it and love Jesus more. Um, and so there is a bit of a crisis in that moment where you're the, the way that you've done life, the way that Lauren and I would talk about it is we've got to find the new normal. What does the new normal look like for us? Because there was this normal and in an instant it was gone. Mm. And, mm. and you want to, I mean like in an instant in, yeah. in a, I got out of bed, I gave my daughter a bottle I put her in her little Johnny jump up thing and then everything changed about our routines, uh, about our diet, about what we could and couldn't do. And then for the next few years that dominated, that new normal dominated our lives. Uh, and it wasn't like we got to grow into it. It was like, it's here. 
Mm -hmm. and, and it's got to be addressed now. So it is quite jostling. Yeah. And I guess for many people, you know, our identity is what we do and you can lose that. And, yeah. and I, I mean, I was similar, it, you know, literally got off a train on the way home, my legs buckled. I suddenly felt really breathless. I was taken off spook pneumonia and it was then that they discovered what was wrong with me. And, um, you know, I, I'm not able to work at the moment. No, no idea whether I'll get back struggling with that kind of concentration and mental energy type of thing still. So I guess even for me personally, just kind of selfishly at that moment, you know, it's very easy sometimes to sort of think, well, you know, is, is, where is the meaning and purpose in life when, when you can't do those things that you wanted to do? Any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, well, I, and again, this is where I think the Lord's kindness to me was, and, and we write about this quite a bit in the book, um, that I had been trying to prepare this very young congregation for suffering because of the kind of suffering we were enduring. And, and you can read all the stories about that in the book, but the, like the Lord's kindness to me was that in the middle of all these tragedies we were enduring as a very young congregation, predominantly in our twenties, uh, maybe our old, our old folk were, you know, my age now, uh, 45, 40, 45, you're like, Oh, these old people are here. But, um, the, like, like, as I was trying to get them ready to suffer, the Lord was getting me ready. Um, mm -hmm. and so I had at a, theological, theoretical level, um, done the homework and, and had some of the kind of foundational moorings that I would need in this season to stop that fall. Cause I remember the floor falling out from under me. Um, and, and it took about 48, 72 hours for, for me to land again. And one of the places, some of the places that I landed were those places that I had been preaching to our congregation to believe and remember these things for the day of trouble. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that was the Lord's kindness to me is that I'd spent all this time trying to get this young congregation ready and never even thought, Oh, I'm getting myself ready, but that's what the Lord was doing in his kindness. So what would be the kind of top three or four things that you would really want to ram home for someone if you only had two minutes or whatever? Yeah. You know, the, I think the overwhelming one for me was that um, regardless of regardless of the type of suffering or the timing of suffering, um, I need only look to the cross to see that God's love for me is, is a very real thing in, in these spaces where I won't be able to understand why and how this things, because you know, the thing that will always fascinate me about Job is that God never really answered any of his questions. Yeah. He just said, hey, where were you? Got some questions for you. So the lesson there in Job is, hey, listen, there, there's some things you're just not going to see and you're not going to be able to understand. And then, man, you, you won't ever be able to make sense of. And it's going to look strange to you. You know why? Because you're, you're finite and I'm infinite. And, but if you look to the cross, you, you can see that my love for you is, it is just, you should not doubt it. That This is the price that's been paid for my glory, your joy, our, your salvation. I have bought you with a price. Um, and so that truth in particular for me, that the cross bids me repeatedly to come back to the fact that God loves me, has adopted me as a son, cares for me. And therefore what I am enduring is not punitive. I am not being punished by God with brain cancer because I, um, didn't have a more consistent quiet time or that one guy didn't share the gospel with on the plane that I should have, or because of this or because of that, or man, I should have given more mm -hmm. of my money or I, I, you know, I, I shouldn't be in, in the place of comfort that I'm in or I'm right. It, it just eradicates those thoughts to be reminded by looking to the cross for the comfort of knowing that I am a, a priest in the kingdom of God. I am an heir to the promise. I've been bought with a price and, and the cross shows me that all those things are true, the cross and the empty tomb, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so of, of all the things that, that I taught in the years leading up to my own diagnosis, it was that that caught me, right? Very good. The, the exodus in the exodus where um, the, the people are like, have you delivered us out of bondage just to kill us in the desert, Moses? You know, why, why didn't you let us? Yeah. And, and I can <laughs> throw a little bit of that in me, right? Where the, the Lord did not save me to himself to, to abandon me and, and destroy me in this wilderness. And, um, and that was more of an ancillary one. But to me, it was just the cross and the resurrection bid me to believe 
that God loves me in Jesus Christ. And, and therefore this is not his wrath, but some kind of mercy. And I'm just not going to probably get to understand that. And honestly, this, I'm a decade later. I don't know that I understand all the intricacies. I can see more clearly now how he used that season in me and how he used that season in others. Um, but, but it's still, there's still quite a bit of mystery to me in, in that season and what exactly that was. Yeah. I know one thing that people sometimes struggle with is the idea that not just that God uses it, but that God somehow allows it. And that certainly seems to be biblical sovereignty of God, that he's all powerful. He could stop things or he could, but also some people go even a step further than that and almost feel that God almost is the author of it. And that, as you say, you, you hinted a bit there that he's punishing or enjoying or somehow yeah. actually it's his best for us. It, it, sure. Did you struggle with those thoughts sometimes or? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think I did struggle with those mm. in particular. Um, trying to think through the earlier days, the earlier days that man that I had, you know, two really dark years. Um, and then we started just getting good news after good news after good news. And, and that's where we are today. Right. I still have to go in for scans and those scans mm. continue to come back clean. They're not watching anything per se. They're watching for something. So I don't go in because I've got a little tumor left that they're making sure it's not growing. I'm going in to make sure there's not a new tumor because that tumor's gone. Oh, that's so great. trying to think back in the, the early two years um, of my season, I, I don't know that that was one in particular. I think the thing that I struggle most, most with, and, I, and again, I write about this in the, the last chapter that I write in the book is more about the lessons I learned in this season, but... Mm. One of the things the, sur the, the spirit surfaced in me was just some real self-righteousness Be because um, I was wondering why it was me and not some other people uh, and some very specific people that, that I knew were that the story I tell is that there was a guy, um, there was a serial adulterer, it's a horrific man, uh, narcissistic, um, said the most terrible things to his beautiful daughters. I mean, just wreaking havoc. And I remember thinking, really, me? I'm the one that's got cancer. This guy's getting to continue to do what he's doing. And, and I, I, I don't get to walk my daughters down the aisle. I don't get to, like, really, Lord? And, and I, I caught myself in the moment and just realized how horrible of a thought that was and how self-righteous I was being. And um, so that I, was, I struggled more in those spaces, I think. Mm, very good. Well, I'm conscious I've taken an awful lot of your time. Um, but just going back to the book for a minute, um, this book, 10 years on, why now? And what are the key things for someone to take? Is, is this a book for someone suffering or for a book for everyone to prepare for suffering or a bit of both? Yeah, I think it's a, probably a bit of bo both. It's not just my story. It's the story of several other men and women here at the Village Church uh, who endured specific seasons. And that's everything from loss of a child to loss of a spouse uh, to long-term suffering, to uh, emotional, so so there's there's a bit of um, there's a bit of something I think for everyone, uh, and and the book is is supposed to be a very encouraging book. So yeah. it's just like wah, wah, you know, this is just get ready to be depressed as you must. <laughs> Although, man, I even as I even though I lived some of these stories with some of these men and women, man, I I would tear up frequently just as they're, as I got to read through their chapters and, um, and to see the hope that they had in the Lord and how the Lord um, ministered in these really beautiful ways and some of the more darker um, times imaginable. Well, that's, that's wonderful. So I guess um, I just wondered if perhaps as we close, you might uh, be able to pray for me and for others that might be watching who are in the middle of, of, of difficulties and, and watching this. It's not just a theory or something that might happen in the future, but it's something they're walking right now. Yeah, I would love to. Father, I thank you for your sustaining power and grace. And, and maybe somebody's watching this um, that, that's just in the darkest season of their life. And so I, I just pray that the words that we've spoken today and that uh, Adrian and I have been able to talk through concerning your character, your essence, who you are, uh, Father, that you would encourage and bolster that man or woman watching this right now. And I, I pray for my friend, uh, Father, just such joy that he brings to me uh, in his love for you and his a hope that's been rooted in you. And so I, I just want to pray healing over him in the name of Jesus, just not with magic prayers or uh, because I'm something special, but because you are good and you are kind and you ask us to ask. And so according to your word, I, I ask that you heal my brother in the name of Jesus Christ, that energy and vitality would return to his body 
quickly, uh, and that even this afternoon he would begin to, um, or even this evening, I guess, time change, would he would begin to get a sense of, of energy returning to his body and, um, and, and strength returning to his frame. And, and, and Father, that he and the community of faith that he belongs to, uh, Father, would rejoice all the more in you, the God of their salvation. And so uh, we thank you and bless your name that you hear us, you see us, you love us, uh, sustain us in this broken and fallen world. I thank you that you have promised to be near to us and that you don't leave our side, uh, even in the midst of uh, difficult and dark days. Help us believe, give us more faith, and it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks, Matt. I think I'll uh, leave the recording there.